All of us do things regularly and frequently, things that we don't put a lot of intentionality behind, but yet we're still practicing those things. Those are habits. You see, habits are an overflow of our Christian calling to love God first and to love our neighbor as ourself. So why are habits important? Well, it's not just so I can get stuff done. God uses our habits to bring about change. How do you grow in actually wanting what God wants for your life? It's through frequent practices of obedience. It's through sanctifying habits. I wanna start by talking about the importance of our habits. Aristotle is famous for saying, it makes no small difference then, whether we form habits of one kind or of another from our very youth. It makes a very great difference, or rather, all the difference. When Aristotle spoke about habits, he talked about frequent practices and character traits. He said the types of things that you do are a reflection of who you are. Oh, and the things that you do will shape you into who you are. You see, all of us possess habits. All of us do things regularly and frequently, things that we don't put a lot of intentionality behind, but yet we're still practicing those things. Those are habits. And what if those habits were actually affecting us in ways that we hadn't considered? What if those habits were directing and guiding us? Well, I would argue in part that that is what happens. In 2020, I had the privilege of bringing some of my research in a culmination to write a book called Heart and Habits. And it was my intent to help show that there is an interplay, a symbiosis between your heart and the things that you regularly do. So we wouldn't agree with Aristotle. He wasn't a follower of Christ. We wouldn't say that everything Aristotle said is true, but it seems like some of his observations were getting close to the importance of habits. What are habits? You see, no matter what literature you read on habits, everyone's gonna talk about habits as being important and formative in our lives. But when I started studying habits, that didn't really answer the question for me regarding not only what is important about habits, but what's biblically important about habits. Does God see our habits as being important? So that set me on a journey to begin to study not only the Bible, what the Bible has to say, but historical theology. What have others said about the Bible regarding habits? Going back to the 16th century, I found that the English Puritans had much to say about habits. The Puritans were theologians who were astute in the ability of taking the Bible and applying it to complex matters. So things like practical theology, which would be how the Bible applies to the daily issues of life, repentance, relationships, and of course, habits. What I hope to share with you today is in part a reflection of what the Puritans have said about habits and their importance in our lives. They used an analogy, it was that of a spark. Perhaps you've been camping before. In California, it's a little challenging at times to have campfires. We'll go to different sites and be given the opportunity to build a campfire and then other campsites where it's too dry and too dangerous. But most of the time, we get to enjoy a campfire. Growing up, that was one of my fondest memories in camping is going and building a fire, sitting around the fire and just chit-chatting. Well, if you've ever built a campfire, you know that it's not exactly easy work. You have to go out and harvest wood. Perhaps you gotta drag it long distances, you load it up in the truck, you put it in the back of the Jeep, whatever that is, and then you bring it back to your campsite so that you can have something to burn later that evening. And even whenever you're preparing to start the fire as evening rolls around, you have to take your wood, put it in a strategic location, get some kindling, and build your fire properly. You just can't throw the wood out on the floor or throw it out on the campsite and expect that your campfire would do well. You see, our habits are very much like building a campfire. It takes a lot of work sometimes. That Sometimes we have to go and chop some wood and that's not easy. There are significant changes that we have to practice. We have to not only chop wood, but we have to move it. We have to position it. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. When we're changing habits, at times there's a lot of effort that goes into that process. Yet when the campfire is built, it's easier to sustain. If you've ever been camping and you know that the fire is going, you can just kind of toss a log into it every 30, 45 minutes and sustain the flame. That's what it's like with good habits. That good habits make it easier for us to function and to honor the Lord. When we talk about good habits, we're gonna talk about not only things that are sanctifying as opposed to sinful, We'll just talk about helpful habits as well. 
that there are times when we have good habits that are helping us glorify God and get things done. And then there are gonna be times when actually we have really bad habits that are destructive and they're hurtful to us. So when building a campfire, it takes work, and yet at the end of the day, you could do all of that work and you could not experience any flame unless you had some type of lighter, matches, or the equivalent of. That's the way that it works for us in regard to habits and true biblical change. You see, the Puritans use the idea of a spark to illustrate that unless God gives that initial spark, there will be no change in our life, no change in our hearts, no change in our actions, because God is the one that has to develop. God is the one that has to transform us. He has to give us that spark. So I could build the world's most grandiose bonfire, and yet if I don't have a match and I don't have a flame, it won't succeed. It's like that in our lives, too, that without God's animation, God's empowerment, God's transformation of our hearts, it doesn't matter what habits we do, we are still missing that spark of change. But here is where the conversation stalls a bit. We say, well, God, we want you to change us. We want you to bring about change in us. But yet we're not practicing what God has called us to practice. There are going to be times when we are kind of laying comatose next to the fire saying, Lord, change me. But the fire's not built. We haven't prepared in any way. We're not doing certain things to help us grow. Rather, we're laying in a comatose state saying, Lord, zap me so that I can change, when in reality, God is going to work through your frequent practices to bring about change in your life. So you have an obligation to harvest wood, to stack wood, to be ready, and yet God is the one that uses those actions to bring about change in your life. That's part of the importance of your habits. Another aspect of your habits is that your habits shape what you want and they shape who you are. In lecture three, I'm gonna show you that our character is actually formed through our daily practices. That means that practically the type of person that you become is reflective of what you do every day. Are you a mean person? Are you an inconsiderate person? Are you a person that talks over other people and interrupts them? Well, guess what? Those frequent habits, those practices that you do every day, sometimes without even thinking, actually shapes you into a certain kind of person. Not only do habits shape our character, sometimes deform our character, but habits also shape what we want. I was meeting with a guy in, in a counseling context, and he asked me this question, and it was very profound. It struck me. This was about seven years ago, and the question is still stuck with me. He said, Greg, what do you do whenever your want to is broken? <laughs> I thought, that's good. What, you know, like, what, what do you do when you really don't want what God wants for your life. Somewhat the question of our Christian existence, is it not? Are we gonna walk by faith or are we gonna walk by sight? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. In that moment when your want to is broken, do you practice what God is calling you to practice or do you not? Well, I'm gonna show you and I'll argue for you and hope to show you biblically that what you do in the times when you don't want to will actually affect what you want to. Let's see if I can say that in a clear way. What you frequently do shapes what you want to do. So there are gonna be times when what God is calling you to do is not exactly what you want to do. Well, the question will be, how does that change? How do you grow in actually wanting what God wants for your life? It's through frequent practices of obedience. It's through sanctifying habits. There are gonna be times where it feels like you are force feeding yourself God's word, and yet that's exactly what you should be doing because that's a habit. And that force feeding of yourself of God's word is what brings about transformation at the level of what you want and your desires. So our habits are important because they shape our desires, they shape what we want, and they also transform our character. Another reason that habits are important is because God uses our habits to bring about change. I mentioned this a second ago where at times we want God to transform our lives, but in reality, what we are doing is we are being idle. We're waiting on some miraculous moment and we see the Christian life as God is gonna bring maybe healing or some type of transformative action and all of a sudden, voila, I have been sanctified. 
But if you're a follower of Christ, you recognize the nature of sanctification is not instantaneous. In fact, God rarely works in instantaneous ways to sanctify and set you apart, but often works in incremental ways. What do I mean by that? I mean progressive sanctification and the doctrine of progressive sanctification is that God is working in you. Yes, he's doing that. That's his work. He's animating your good works. But it's you that is called to work out your salvation. You have to break a holy sweat, so to speak. You know, we're in the gym. We're getting our spiritual sweat on 1 Timothy 4.7. We're not only exercising our bodies, we're exercising for godliness, that our spiritual walk should be noted by spiritual effort. The Puritan said, hey, look, don't expect for God to blow that spark up within you apart from your good works. God uses your good works, not your idleness, to bring about transformation. Our habits are so important because one of the aspects of our habits is that God works through them to accomplish his will in our life and to bring change and transformation to us. That's why it's heart and habits. We could just say, Lord, zap me. We're laying comatose next to the fire. Zap me, Lord, transform me. But that's not the way that it works, that God works through your frequent actions to sanctify you and set you apart. So your habits are going to shape your desires, they're going to shape your character, but God's gonna use them to help bring about transformation in your life. You see, many people start their effort of changing and tweaking habits because they wanna get stuff done. There is a thousand secular books out there that speak to efficiency, productivity, advancing yourself, and so forth. And habits can do that. Good habits of organization can help make you more efficient. Imagine this with me. Imagine every time I got ready to leave my house, I could not find my car keys. At first might be kind of funny, okay, ha, ha, ha. My family's waiting, dad can't find his keys again, mildly funny. But day three, day four, week three, week four, that habit of disorganization is actually now kind of a nuisance. And it's now kind of irritating to my whole family. It takes me 15 minutes to get my stuff together. Of course, habits can bring about blessings of organization, but we do recognize that that's not the ultimate purpose of our habits. That's a secondary or tertiary purpose, that our habits are really, first of all, to help us honor God. That we want the things that we habitually do to automate us in some way, to habituate us to where honoring the Lord is somewhat second nature to us. Let me see if I can give you an example of this. Imagine with me that I had a habit of listening to you, so much so that I don't even have to think about it anymore, I just listen. That's just what I do, I just listen to you and I take seriously what you're saying, I don't interrupt you, I reflect on what you're saying and, I, and generally speaking, I can understand you, that I'm prioritizing you and valuing you. That habit of me listening to you can become something that's just ingrained, it's compulsory for me, it's what I do, it's just how I think about things. That habit can contribute to me honoring the Lord and honoring the Lord as I relate to you. Now, you could put yourself in that same context and think of a dozen other ways in which that would apply. That you could have habits of thinking, renewing your mind with the truths of Scripture, habits of communication, habits of honoring and serving other people where you go out of your way to open doors, bring coffee to, give rides to, whatever that looks like. That those habits aren't about efficiency and productivity first, it's about glorifying the Lord first. Secondarily, it's about doing good. That we wanna honor the Lord habitually. We want it to be almost automated in our life where our habits make it easy for us to honor the Lord, but we also wanna do good to other people. The purpose of our habits is not that we would just get stuff done because technically I could get stuff done and not do good to other people. Go back to the listening illustration. You and I are in conversation and I just say like, hey, sh I, gotta, I gotta get some stuff done, sorry. And then I walk away from the conversation. Well, I actually might be able to get more tasks done in my day if I, if I told people, hey, shush, I'm done, like conversation is over. But yet we do recognize that wouldn't be what honors the Lord most or does good to other people. In fact, there are times when the Lord has called us to be compassionate and to pause and to lend an ear to those that are hurting or those that are having a difficult day. So if I'm so focused on efficiency and productivity, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, next thing, next thing, next thing, check, 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 that I fail to stop and say, hey, look, how's your day going? 
oh man, I am so sorry to hear about your family member. I'm so sorry to hear about the struggles at your work. If I'm so focused on efficiency and productivity that I'm not doing good to other people, then I'm actually missing the purpose of habits. You see, habits are an overflow of our Christian calling to love God first and to love our neighbor as ourself. So why are habits important? Well, it's not just so I can get stuff done. And yet I can get stuff done with habits. But that's goal three. My first goal is that I want my life to be so engineered, so ready, so primed, that I am almost out of second nature honoring the Lord. Then I'm almost out of second nature doing good to you or you're doing good to others, that you're able to almost automatically listen well, be kind, respond in a patient way that you almost automatically are honoring and serving people without putting much effort into it because that is what you do. That is a habit that you have developed. And then we focus on getting stuff done. It would be somewhat odd and strange of us to say, well, we want habits that are actually gonna be really difficult and make things difficult in our lives. We would like to complicate our lives rather than streamline them. No, it's, It's totally fair to seek to be more organized and more productive, to use your time well, to manage certain resources God's entrusted to you. But that's number three. That's not number one. Number three is that we get stuff done. Number one is that we honor the Lord in all that we do, especially in our habits. So when you consider the importance of habits, you might go, hey, look, Greg, I don't want to wake up at 5.30 a.m. You know, like, leave it to that crew. Leave it to the type A's, and they're just going to be up at 5 a.m. exercising and acting all weird and stuff. It's like, hey, you're right, they're gonna be doing that, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about are the things that you do every day, that you have habits, and the habits that you do, even if it's not getting up at 5.30 a.m. but sleeping till noon, those habits are shaping what you want, they're shaping who you are, they're shaping how you glorify God and do good to others, and ultimately, those habits that you have or don't have are gonna be what help promote change in your life, or maybe even what hinder change. In our next lecture, I'll do my best to show you the different definitions of habits, biblically speaking, and then understanding the spheres in which those habits would operate.